marriage exists for, the reason for marriage, to raise children according to God's plan. To raise children according to God's plan. That this is God's design that God made a man and then he made a woman to do things that a man can't do. A man cannot bring forth life. God's looking at a man and he's like, hey, what, what do I need to do? What wiring do I need to change within him so that life can be brought forth? You know what? I will create a separate being apart from him so that life can be brought forth by the two of them coming together in this act that I invented, that I created, that I am the master of. No one knows how to do it better than God. You want tips, tricks, and techniques? Read your Bible because he's the one who invented the act. He's the one that, that thought of the parts, made them work the way they do. The parts you see and the parts you don't see. That was God's genius design. And so together, man and woman, as complementary equals, take on this task of the first great commission. The second great commission we see in Matthew 28. Go into the world, go into the nations, telling them the things that I've told you, who I am, Jesus says. But the first great commission shows up here in Genesis where God says, hey, I want you to form and fill the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. Have lots of babies and tell them who I am. Some people say that the religion of Islam is growing faster than Christianity. If you look at the data, there are more converts in Christianity. Islam, if it is growing faster than Christianity, it's only because of procreation, reproduction. They have more babies than Christians do. Why? Because Christians live in America where everybody wants two kids, one boy and one girl. You know, I mean, it's this like simple worldview that we have. We, we think, hey, I know what I want my life to be like. We say, hey, I'm gonna make those decisions according to my preference, not according to God's word, not according to what he says. How many babies do I wanna have? That's how many I'm gonna have. God, how many babies do you want me to have? Have you ever thought about that? Does he say, does he say anything about that? Does his word say anything about how many babies we should have? In Psalm 127, it says that children are a blessing from the Lord. Blessed is the man who has lots of them, whose quiver is full of them, it says. And so if you begin to think about children as a burden, you don't see children the way God sees children. God says they're a blessing. If you begin to think about children according to what Hollywood, TV, media, radio, magazines have told you about children, or your non-believing friends have told you about children, then you don't see children according to a biblical worldview as God says that children are. Let me just bring this really close to home. Monica and I, we had one child. We had Presley. She was born. Presley Kate. Uh, Presley, <laughs> whoo, Presley did not stop crying for nine months, okay? She did not sleep for nine months. I mean, I, I'm hardly exaggerating. It was, I was just like, there is no way it is this hard. There is no way that everybody goes through this. I mean, we were like so done. I'm thinking vasectomy. If you don't know what that is, we'll explain it later. But, <laughs> but I, I'm thinking long-term birth control. And then we have Finley, and we both cried a lot. How did this happen, you know? I can't keep my hands to myself. And then, <laughs> and, and we were done though. We were done. And then we had Weston. And now we're done, for real. <laughs> Except I started reading this. I turned to Psalm 127 and I'm like, do I see children as a blessing? And I said, babe, I don't know if we should be done. Can we be done? And we started this wrestling that, that I just want to be really transparent with you. I'm right in the middle of. I, I hardly feel equipped to even instruct you in this way because I'm like, man, God, can we be done? Like I always thought it was a, up to me and my preference and what I wanted. And then I opened the word and you say these things that you have these desires and that you want Christians to fill the earth through procreation and should we even prevent that? Should we stop that? These are all questions we're asking. And I don't have the answers for you this evening, but I do have this. I'm certain of this. You need to be asking these questions. As you think about marriage, if you want a family, if you want children, you, you need to be thinking, you know, start with his word. Can I stop that, prevent that? Should I throttle that? 
are those things that I should even do? I know this is strange, so I'm asking the question, what informs your decisions, your preferences, or God's word? And so let me just show you what a biblical worldview is. I'm committed to keeping this graph in front of you a lot. And so this really paints a picture. It's going to pop up there in a minute magically. This paints a picture of what worldview is. And so worldview, when you hear biblical worldview, worldview answers the question, what is real? Worldview sits underneath your beliefs. Your beliefs answer the question, what is true? From your beliefs come your values or your goals, if you will. That asks the question, what is good? And out of that comes your behavior. That's what everybody else sees. That's what we do. So you have worldview, beliefs, goals, and behavior. And so if you have a self-centered worldview around marriage, this is what it looks like. Your self-centered worldview say, what is real? Well, my desires are real. Okay, and then you think, okay, well, well, then what is true? Well, here's what is true. Sex feels good. Kids are a burden. And so then you ask the question, what is good? Well, pleasure is ultimately good. Anything that feels good, anything that satisfies my desires. And so then what do you do? You date around and you get stuck there. And it's from a cultural worldview, a worldly worldview, a self-centered worldview. And so if you take this book, and you put it in the middle there, right? Then it's gonna change. It's, you're gonna get what's called a biblical worldview. A biblical worldview asks the question, what is real? Well, God is real. His kingdom is real. His plans are real for you. He created you. He created you with a purpose. It's your job to find God's purpose for your life. This is very different than you're gonna hear in Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, downtown, right? This is different. What is real? God is real. What is true? Well, then God's word is true. God's word needs to inform everything I do. God's word needs to inform the way I think about relationships, what I do for the weekend, the way that I date, the way that I spend time with each other. What is good? God's word says children are good. Marriage is a good thing. Regardless of what I've seen, God's word says marriage is good and children are good. And so what do we do? We marry and we make disciples or... We honor God in our singleness and we make disciples. We do everything we can for God's glory. Now that may feel like a huge life change from where you're at right now. The way you get there is one step at a time. You begin to ingest his word, know what it says, know that he informs these decisions and ask God, what would you have for me? Having a great marriage starts there. It starts when you're 18, 17, 16. It starts when you're 13, when you begin to learn the word of God and you write it on your heart and you understand his desires for your life. And so God made marriage and asked us to have babies and disciple them. And the way that we do that is through sex to becoming one flesh. And God made sex feel good. But the the pleasure in sex serves a purpose. Let me say that again so you understand. The pleasure in sex serves a purpose. Think about if, if sex felt like a root canal, how long, listen, humor me, how long would it take for the extinction of humanity? Right? Like this thing that brings forth humans really, really hurts and nobody wants to do it. It'd be like generation one, done, like nobody else left, right? But God made it feel good so that we would come together, that we couldn't keep our hands to ourselves, and that babies would be brought forth. And what we do is we try to capture the, set, the pleasure of sex without the purpose of sex so that we can use it for our own selfish desires. 